Golden Bridge was the first Catholic cemetery to be authorised in Ireland since the 16th century. It opened in 1829. It was closed 40 years later in 1868, and the story of why it opened and why it closed is compelling and consequential because of its unique place in Irish history. This is its story. At the beginning of the 1800s, Ireland was emerging from oppressive legal restrictions on the practice of Catholicism. These had begun during the reign of King Henry VIII in the 16th century, when land, monasteries and other properties owned by the Catholic Church were suppressed and given to royal supporters, or ruined. The restrictions intensified under the penal laws, beginning in 1697, that banned Catholics from all sorts of activities, including becoming members of the Irish Parliament. The repressive penal laws outlawed the public performance of Catholic services for the living and for the dead. Catholics, and indeed all non-Anglican congregations, were prevented from having their own burial grounds. They were obliged to dispose of their dead in Anglican graveyards and pay burial fees to the local Protestant minister. The laws were designed to neuter the political power of Catholics and force them to abandon their allegiance to the Church of Rome. 85% of the Irish population was Catholic, most of whom remained steadfast in their religion. However, they were forced to practice their religion in secret. They attended religious services in undisclosed places, including so-called mass rocks. Though illegal, Many buried their dead in monastic ruins and other holy places, often in the dead of night. The punitive laws were enforced most vigorously in and around Dublin, the home of Dublin Castle, the administrative centre of British rule in Ireland. Here, it was more difficult to flaunt the laws, including those regulating burial places and funeral services. Most deceased Catholic Dubliners were buried in one of three places. Bully's Acre, located just outside the city limits, had been the final resting place for hundreds of thousands of Dubliners, rich and poor, for more than a thousand years. Few grave markers are to be seen today. That's because, in an effort to close the cemetery in 1755, most of the headstones were levelled, to discourage burials and visits by mourners. It finally closed in 1832, when it became full, due to the massive number of burials of cholera victims in unmarked mass graves. St James's churchyard on James's Street was used not only because it had been a Catholic burial ground before the Reformation, but it was also the prime location in Dublin for celebrating the annual feast day of St. James the Apostle on July the 25th. Pilgrims would meet outside the church and begin the Camino de Santiago and head to the Shrine of the Apostle in the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. The third place often used for Catholic funerals was St. Kevin's Anglican Churchyard on Camden Row, now in ruins. Unwittingly, it played a pivotal role in the campaign for a new Catholic cemetery. Though some Protestant graveyards tolerated the participation of Catholic priests in funerals, others enforced the letter of the law. During the large funeral, of a well-known Dublin citizen in St. Kevin's in 1823, the Protestant sexton reprimanded the Catholic Archdeacon of Dublin for reciting some Catholic funeral prayers. This rebuke caused a massive outcry among Catholics and caught the attention of Daniel O'Connell. O'Connell, a charismatic barrister and politician, had established the Catholic Association to campaign for an end to religious discrimination. He skillfully used the St. Kevin incident to pressure the authorities 
to grant Catholic emancipation. At the same time, O'Connell and his supporters appointed a committee to find land for a new burial ground where members of every religion, and none, could conduct whatever funeral service they wished, without interference or insult. O'Connell was an exceptional orator, and during monster meetings, he riled up as many as 40,000 spectators. To ease tensions, the authorities repealed statutes prohibiting burials in old Catholic graveyards and suppressed monasteries, and it authorised the opening of new Catholic burial grounds. As Protestants owned most of the land in and around Dublin, the acquisition of a plot for a non-Anglican cemetery was difficult and took several years. But in 1828, a Protestant agreed to sell, for £600, a two-acre tract of land at Goldenbridge in Inchicore on the south side of Dublin. The consecration of Golden Bridge Cemetery took place on the 15th of October, 1829, just six months after the passing of the Act of Catholic Emancipation. 18-year-old Margaret Lowry was the first to be buried here. During the next two years, 12,000 corpses were buried and funerals averaged 20 a day, six days a week. The cemetery was popular because its burial fees were less than half those charged at St. James's graveyard. Several Irish rebels are buried in Goldenbridge. Patrick O'Kelly claimed to have been one of the leaders of the 1798 United Irishman Rebellion and published an account of his experiences. He died in 1858. In 1866, William Sheedy was charged with being a member of the Fenian Brotherhood, a secret society committed to overthrowing British rule by physical force. He was imprisoned for two years and, shortly after his release, he died and was buried in Golden Bridge. This fine monument rises above the tomb of Dean Lube, who had helped acquire the land for Golden Bridge. The high mortality rate among children is evident from the inscriptions on many gravestones. Mary, the only daughter of Morris and Francis Redmond, was 10 years old when she died in 1854. Patrick Birmingham's son James died in 1865, aged 14 months, and a second son, Thomas, died a year later when he was 10 months old. Three children of the Fleming family died within an eight-year period beginning in 1860. Jeremiah, aged two years and eight months, Josephine, aged eight months, and Annie, aged 14 years and four months. Buried in a corner of the cemetery are unmarked mass graves with an unknown number of victims of the catastrophic Great Famine of 1845 to 1847 and the cholera epidemics of 1832 and 1869. Golden Bridge was the first cemetery of its kind in Ireland, a carefully designed garden cemetery. It was modelled on Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris that opened in 1804 and inspired by the designs of Scottish garden designer John Claudius Loden, who believed that cemeteries should not only be final resting places for the dead, but should also be gardens of relaxation and recreation for the living. Well-paved paths were lined with evergreen trees to create an atmosphere of mourning and reflection and provide open spaces for recreation. Yew trees were planted because their poisonous seeds ensured that farmers prevented their animals from straying into the cemetery. According to tradition, Daniel O'Connell planted this impressive silver birch tree. The stone arch above the iron gate entrance bears the inscription D.O.M. 
Some local wags say these stand for dead old men, but they are actually the initials of the Latin words Deo Optimo Maximo, meaning to God the best, the greatest. Beside the entrance is a lodge that was built with apartments for the sexton. A high perimeter wall prevented unauthorized entry and theft, especially body snatching, which was rampant in Dublin. This reassured relatives of the deceased that their loved ones would be well protected from grave robbers who sought to extract freshly buried corpses and sell them to medical schools for inspection and dissection. Some graves had metal railings or heavy slabs for added protection. Security measures were also built into the Roman temple-like mortuary chapel that opened in the centre of the cemetery in 1829. It had a roof space and a basement chamber where night watchmen and their Cuban bloodhounds monitored the cemetery to detect and disrupt body snatchers. Security must have been effective, as there are no recorded instances of body snatching here. A grid system, using painted numbers and letters of the Roman alphabet, was used to enable mourners to locate graves. As the demand for burials in Golden Bridge grew rapidly, O'Connell foresaw that a second cemetery would soon be required, and the Catholic Association set about acquiring more land. In 1831, it purchased nine acres on the north side of Dublin, and in 1832, Prospect Cemetery opened. Its name was changed to Glasnevin Cemetery in 1867, after additional land had been acquired. Like Golden Bridge, Glasnevin was designed as a garden cemetery. Daniel O'Connell died in 1847, and his remains lie in a crypt beneath this monumental round tower that was built with the aid of public subscriptions. Today, O'Connell is one of 1.5 million permanent residents in Glasnevin Cemetery. After Glasnevin opened, funerals at Golden Bridge reduced to an average of 500 a year. Glasnevin, however, did not cause the demise of Golden Bridge. It was forced to close by the British Army in Ireland. Golden Bridge was bounded on three sides by Richmond Barracks, which was built to counter the threat of an invasion by Napoleon. It was first occupied by the British Army in 1814. During the 1860s, military officers lodged a formal complaint. They asserted that water seeping from the cemetery was contaminating the Grand Canal that flowed just outside the cemetery's southern wall. The canal was a source of drinking water for British troops and their families who lived in and around the barracks. However, an inspection of the site revealed that the cemetery had good drainage and the more likely reason for military objection was that troops frequently ended up drinking with mourners after funerals. Another formal complaint alleged that noise and commotion caused by the numerous rowdy funeral processions passing the barracks was disrupting military activities. Following a hearing, the Lord Chancellor of Ireland, Thomas O'Hagan, closed the graveyard in 1869 and restricted future interments to those who had acquired rights of burial by purchase or had relatives already interred in Golden Bridge. Despite the proximity of the barracks to the cemetery, few soldiers were buried here, but 200 of their children were. William Thompson was one of them. He was three years and four months old when he died in May 1834, just six months after his arrival at the barracks. His father was a sergeant in the Royal Regiment. Martha Tuckwell's father was bandmaster with the 12th Regiment of Foot. She died in April 1856 
and was two years and eight months old. Mary Nolan was one of a few soldiers' wives buried in the cemetery. She died in 1851, aged 51. Her husband was a quartermaster. Ellen was the young wife of Sergeant George Ramsden, a member of the military band. She was almost 23 years old when she died in 1844. After Golden Bridge was closed, as time passed, its monuments and greystones were weathered by wind and rain and shrouded with an abundance of foliage. As the cemetery stagnated, just outside, momentous events were taking place in the barracks. The First World War began in 1914 and many enlisted Irishmen were stationed here before heading overseas to fight the German army. After the failed Easter Rising in 1916, more than 3,000 rebels were captured and marched to Richmond Barracks for interrogation and judgment. Leaders of the rebellion were identified and plucked out of the crowd for judgment. 90 Republicans received death sentences and were escorted to Kilmainham Jail to await execution. The condemned included seven signatories of the Proclamation of the Irish Republic. The intense negative reaction to the first 14 executions prompted the British Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith, to visit Richmond Barracks, after which no further executions took place. Hundreds of the convicted rebels were transported to English prisons to serve their time, and activities in the barracks reverted to supporting Britain's efforts in the Great War, including housing captured German soldiers. During this time, Golden Bridge continued to conduct the occasional burial. Some of those interred had been casualties of the 1916 Rising. 19-year-old volunteer William Francis Burke was killed in action fighting for the rebels. He was related to W.T. Cosgrave, a future head of the Irish government, and is buried on the left-hand side of the Cosgrave plot. Eugene Lynch, aged eight, was one of 40 children killed as a result of the Easter Rising. He was shot by a British soldier while playing football near Richmond Barracks just four days into the Easter Rising. Dr Robert Kenny provided medical attention to the poor in a Dublin workhouse. When he died in 1909, the Irish author James Joyce, who was a family friend, attended his funeral. While attending Trinity College, Andrew Clinch developed a love and a talent for rugby. He played for Ireland between 1892 and 1897 and toured South Africa with the British Lions team in 1896. He served as a medic with the British Army during the First World War. He died in 1937. W.T. Cosgrave was sentenced to death for his part in the 1916 Rising, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison. He was freed as a result of the Anglo-Irish Peace Treaty. After the Civil War, he became chairman of the Provisional Government and later head of the Irish Free State. He retired from politics in 1944 and died in 1965, aged 85. His grave is the most visited in Goldenbridge. Several members of his family lie in Goldenbridge, including his son Liam, who was elected leader of Fianna Gael after his father's death. In 1973, Liam became head of the Irish government. When he died in 2017, aged 97, he joined his wife and father in this burial plot.
After the end of the Irish War of Independence in 1922 and the formation of the Irish Free State Government, the British military vacated Richmond Barracks as the new Irish National Army marched in to take charge. The barracks was renamed Kyo Barracks to commemorate Commandant Tom Kyo, who fought in Ireland's War of Independence. The Irish Army did not stay long in the barracks. It left in 1924, and the buildings were repurposed to house a primary school and living quarters for poor families. The homes became notorious for their deplorable condition and were demolished in 1969 to make way for a group of multi-storey apartment blocks. As the drug epidemic engulfed the estate, their condition deteriorated and they too were demolished. The onslaught of drugs also affected Golden Bridge Cemetery. It became a hangout for dealers and addicts. Several of the monuments and gravestones were vandalised. But that is not the end of the story. The barracks and the cemetery have an afterlife. As Ireland prepared to celebrate the centenary of the 1916 Easter Rising, the surviving buildings of the barracks were refurbished and renovated. It opened as a visitor centre in 2020, with a museum and a local library. The old officers' parade ground was converted into an inviting landscaped garden. Golden Bridge Cemetery also received a makeover. The chapel was restored. Damaged monuments and headstones have been repaired or removed and out-of-control vegetation has been trimmed. The cemetery was officially reopened to the public in 2017, almost 150 years after it was closed. Once more, it's a working cemetery with some 500 burial plots available for purchase. A small columbarium has been added to house cremated remains. The opening of Golden Bridge Cemetery was a nail in the coffin of the penal laws. For this alone, it has earned its place in Irish history. Beyond that, it's a wonderful place to visit and explore the thousands of monuments and gravestones. And it's a tranquil oasis in a busy capital city in which to ruminate, rest and refresh. Thank you.